Chapter 4 of The Hill of Dreams by Arthur Mackin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hill of Dreams. Chapter 4 In the course of the week, Lucian again visited Carmen. He wished to view the amphitheatre more precisely, to note the exact position of the ancient walls, to gaze up the valley from certain points within the town to imprint minutely and clearly on his mind the surge of the hills about the city and the dark tapestry of the hanging woods. And he lingered in the museum where the relics of the Roman occupation had been stored. He was interested in the fragments of tessellated floors, in the glowing gold of drinking cups, the curious beads of fused and colored glass, the carved amber work the scent flagons that still retain the memory of unctuous odors, the necklaces, brooches, hairpins of gold and silver, and other intimate objects which had once belonged to Roman ladies. One of the glass flagons, buried in damp earth for many hundred years, had gathered in its dark grave all the splendors of the light, and now shone like an opal with a moonlight glamour and gleams of gold and pale sunset green and imperial purple. Then there were the wine-jars of red earthenware, the memorial stones from graves, and the heads of broken gods, with fragments of occult things used in the secret rites of Mithras. Lucian read on the labels where all these objects were found, in the churchyard, beneath the turf of the meadow, and in the old cemetery near the forest, and whenever it was possible he would make his way to the spot of discovery and imagine the long darkness that had hidden gold and stone and amber. All these investigations were necessary for the scheme he had in view, so he became, for some time, quite a familiar figure in the dusty deserted streets and in the meadows by the river. His continual visits to Carmen were a torturous puzzle to the inhabitants, who flew to their windows at the sound of a step on the uneven pavements. They were at a loss in their conjectures, His motive for coming down three times a week must, of course, be bad, but it seemed undiscoverable. And Lucian, on his side, was at first a good deal put out by occasional encounters with members of the Gervais or Dixon or Collie tribes. He had often to stop and exchange a few conventional expressions, and such meetings, casual as they were, annoyed and distracted him. He was no longer infuriated or wounded by sneers of contempt, or by the cackling laughter of the young people when they passed him on the road. His hat was a shocking one, and his untidiness terrible. But such incidents were unpleasant just as the smell of a drain was unpleasant, and through the strange mechanism of his thoughts out of fear for the time. Then he had been disgusted by the affair of the boys and the little dog. The loathsomeness of it had quite broken up his fancies. He had read books of modern occultism, and remembered some of the experiments described. The adept, it was alleged, could transfer the sense of consciousness from his brain to the foot or hand. He could annihilate the world around him and pass into another sphere. Lucian wondered whether he could not perform some such operation for his own benefit. Human beings were constantly annoying him and getting in his way. Was it not possible to annihilate the race, or at all events, to reduce them to wholly insignificant forms? A certain process suggested itself to his mind, a work partly mental and partly physical, and after two or three experiments he found to his astonishment and delight that it was successful. Here, he thought, he had discovered one of the secrets of true magic— This was the key to the symbolic transmutations of the Eastern tales. The adept could, in truth, change those who were obnoxious to him into harmless and unimportant shapes, not as in the letter of the old stories, by transforming the enemy, but by transforming himself. The magician puts men below him by going up higher, as one looks down on a mountain city from a loftier crag the stones on the road, and such petty obstacles do not trouble the wise man on the great journey. And so Lucian, when obliged to stop and converse with his fellow-creatures, to listen to their poor pretenses and inanities, 
was no more inconvenience than when he had to climb an awkward stile in the course of a walk. As for the more unpleasant manifestations of humanity, after all, they no longer concerned him. Men intent on the great purpose did not suffer the current of their thoughts to be broken by the buzzing of a fly caught in a spider's web, so why should he be perturbed by the misery of a puppy in the hands of village boys? The fly, no doubt, endured its tortures. Lying helpless and bound in those slimy bands, it cried out in its thin voice when the claws of the horrible monster fastened on it. But its dying agonies had never vexed the reverie of a lover. Lucian saw no reason why the boy should offend him more than the spider, or why he should pity the dog more than he pitied the fly. The talk of the men and women might be wearisome and inept and often malignant, but he could not imagine an alchemist at the moment of success, a general in the hour of victory, or a financier with a gigantic scheme of swindling well on the market being annoyed by the buzz of insects. The spider is, no doubt, a very terrible brute with a hideous mouth and hairy, tiger-like claws when seen through the microscope. But Lucian had taken away the microscope from his eyes. He could now walk the streets of Carmen confident and secure, without any dread of interruption, for at a moment's notice the transformation could be effected. Once Dr. Burroughs caught him and made him promise to attend a bazaar that was to be held in aid of the Hungarian Protestants. Lucian assented, the more willingly, as he wished to pay a visit to certain curious mounds on a hill a little way out of the town, and he calculated on slinking off from the bazaar early in the afternoon. Lord Bemis was visiting Sir Vivian Ponsonby, a local magnate, and had kindly promised to drive over and declare the bazaar open. It was a solemn moment when the carriage drew up and the great man alighted. He was rather an evil-looking old nobleman, but the clergy and gentry, their wives and sons and daughters, welcomed him with great and unctuous joy. Conversations were broken off in mid-sentence. Slow people gaped, not realizing why their friends had so suddenly left them. The Myricks came up hot and perspiring, in fear lest they should be too late. Miss Colley, a yellow virgin of austere regard, smiled largely. Mrs. Dixon beckoned wildly with her parasol to the girls who were idly strolling in a distant part of the field, and the archdeacon ran at full speed. The air grew dark with boughs and resonant with the genial laugh of the archdeacon, the cackle of the younger ladies, and the shrill, parrot-like voices of the matrons. Those smiled who had never smiled before and on some maiden faces there hovered that look of adoring ecstasy with which the old maidens graced their angels. Then, when all the due rites had been performed, the company turned and began to walk towards the booths of their small vanity fair. Lord Bemis led the way with Mrs. Gervais, Mrs. Dixon followed with Sir Vivian Ponsonby, and the multitudes that followed cried, saying, "'What a dear old man!' Isn't it kind of him to come all this way? What a sweet expression, isn't it? I think he's an old love. One of the good old sort. Real English nobleman. Oh, most correct, I assure you. If a girl gets into trouble, notice to quit at once. Always stands by the church. Twenty livings in his gift. Voted for the Public Worship Regulation Act. Ten thousand acres strictly preserved. The old lord was leering pleasantly and muttering to himself, "'Some fine gals here. Like the looks of that filly with the pink hat. Ought to see more of her. She'd give Lottie points.' The pomp swept slowly across the grass. The archdeacon had got hold of Mr. Dixon, and they were discussing the misdeeds of some clergyman in the rural deanery. "'I can scarce credit it,' said Mr. Dixon. "'Oh, I assure you, there can be no doubt.' We have witnesses. There can be no question that there was a procession at Lanfahangel on the Sunday before Easter. The choir and minister went round the church, carrying palm branches in their hands. Very shocking. It has distressed the bishop. Martin is a hard-working man enough and all that, but these sort of things can't be tolerated. The bishop told me that he had set his face against processions. Quite right. The bishop is perfectly right. 
processions are unscriptural. It's the thin edge of the wage, you know, Dixon. Exactly. I have always resisted anything of the kind here. Right. Principius obsta, you know. Martin is so imprudent. There's a way of doing things. The scriptural procession led by Lord Bemis broke up when the stalls were reached and gathered round the nobleman as he declared the bazaar open. Lucian was sitting on a garden seat a little distance off, looking dreamily before him, and all that he saw was a swarm of flies clustering and buzzing about a lump of tainted meat that lay on the grass. The spectacle in no way interrupted the harmony of his thoughts, and soon after the opening of the bazaar he went quietly away, walking across the fields in the direction of the ancient mounds he desired to inspect. All these journeys of his to Carmen and its neighborhood had a peculiar object. He was gradually leveling to the dust the squalid crawls of modern times, and rebuilding the splendid and golden city of Siluria. All this mystic town was for the delight of his sweetheart and himself. For her, the wonderful villas, the shady courts, the magic of tessellated pavements, and the hangings of rich stuffs with their intricate and glowing patterns. Lucian wandered all day through the shining streets, taking shelter sometimes in the gardens beneath the dense and gloomy ilex trees, and listening to the splash and trickle of the fountains. Sometimes he would look out of a window and watch the crowd and color of the marketplace, and now and again a ship came up the river bringing exquisite silks and the merchandise of unknown lands in the far east. He had made a curious and accurate map of the town he proposed to inhabit, in which every villa was set down and named. He drew his lines to scale with the gravity of a surveyor, and studied the plan till he was able to find his way from house to house on the darkest summer night. On the southern slopes about the town there were vineyards, always under a glowing sun, and sometimes he ventured to the furthest ridge of the forest where the wild people still lingered, that he might catch the golden gleam of the city far away, as the light quivered and scintillated on the glittering tiles. And there were gardens outside the city gates, where strange and brilliant flowers grew, filling the hot air with their odor, and scenting the breeze that blew along the streets. The dull modern life was far away, and people who saw him at this period wondered what was amiss. The abstraction of his glance was obvious, even to eyes not over-sharp. But men and women had lost all their power of annoyance and vexation. They could no longer even interrupt his thought for a moment. He could listen to Mr. Dixon with apparent attention, while he was in reality enraptured by the entreating music of the double flute, played by a girl in the garden of Avalonius, for that was the name he had taken. Mr. Dixon was innocently discoursing archaeology, giving a brief résumé of the view expressed by Mr. Wyndham at the last meeting of the Antiquarian Society. "'There can be no doubt that the Temple of Diana stood there in pagan times,' he concluded, and Lucian assented to the opinion, and asked a few questions which seemed pertinent enough but all the time the flute-notes were sounding in his ears, and the ilex threw a purple shadow on the white pavement before his villa. A boy came forward from the garden. He had been walking amongst the vines and plucking the ripe grapes, and the juice had trickled down over his breast. Standing beside the girl, unashamed in the sunlight, he began to sing one of Sappho's love-songs. His voice was as full and rich as a woman's, but purged of all emotion. He was an instrument of music in the flesh. Lucian looked at him steadily. The white perfect body shone against the roses and the blue of the sky, clear and gleaming as marble in the glare of the sun. The words he sang burned and flamed with passion, and he was as unconscious of their meaning as the twin pipes of the flute. And the girl was smiling, the vicar shook hands and went on, well pleased with his remarks on the Temple of Diana, and also with Lucian's polite interest. "'He is by no means wanting in intelligence,' he said to his family. "'A little curious in manner, perhaps, but not stupid. 
Oh, papa, said Henrietta, don't you think he is rather silly? He can't talk about anything, anything interesting, I mean, and he pretends to know a lot about books, but I heard him say the other day he had never read The Prince of the House of David or Ben-Hur. Fancy! The vicar had not interrupted Lucian. The sun still beat upon the roses, and a little breeze bore the scent of them to his nostrils, together with the smell of grapes and vine-leaves. He had become curious in sensation, and as he leant back upon the cushions covered with glistening yellow silk, he was trying to analyze a strange ingredient in the perfume of the air. He had penetrated far beyond the crude distinctions of modern times, beyond the rough, there's a smell of roses, there must be sweetbriar somewhere. Modern perceptions of odor were, he knew, far below those of the savage in delicacy. The degraded black fellow of Australia could distinguish odors in a way that made the consumer of damper stare in amazement. But the savage's sensations were all strictly utilitarian. To Lucian, as he sat in the cool porch, his feet on the marble, the air came laden with scents as subtly and wonderfully interwoven and contrasted as the harmonica of a great master. The stained marble of the pavement gave a cool reminiscence of the Italian mountain. The blood-red roses palpitating in the sunlight sent out an odor mystical as passion itself, and there was a hint of the inebriation in the perfume of the trellised vines. Besides these, the girl's desire and the unripe innocence of the boy were as distinct as benzoine and myrrh, both delicious and exquisite and exhaled as freely as the scent of the roses. But there was another element that puzzled him, an aromatic suggestion of the forest. He understood it at last. It was the vapor of the great red pines that grew beyond the garden. Their spicy needles were burning in the sun, and the smell was as fragrant as the fume of incense blown from far. The soft entreaty of the flute and the swelling rapture of the boy's voice beat on the air together, and Lucian wondered whether there were in the nature of things any true distinction between the impressions of sound and scent and color. The violent blue of the sky, the one mystery, then distinct entities. He could almost imagine that the boy's innocence was indeed a perfume, and that the palpitating roses had become a sonorous chant. In the curious silence which followed the last notes, when the boy and girl had passed under the purple ilex shadow, he fell into a reverie. The fancy that sensations are symbols and not realities hovered in his mind, and led him to speculate as to whether they could not actually be transmuted one into another. It was possible, he thought, that a whole continent of knowledge had been undiscovered the energies of men having been expended in unimportant and foolish directions. Modern ingenuity had been employed on such trifles as locomotive engines, electric cables, and cantilever bridges, on elaborate devices for bringing uninteresting people nearer together. The ancients had been almost as foolish, because they had mistaken the symbol for the thing signified. It was not the material banquet which really mattered, but the thought of it. It was almost as futile to eat and take emetics and eat again as to invent telephones and high-pressure boilers. As for some other ancient methods of enjoying life, one might as well set oneself to improve calico printing at once. Only in the garden of Avalonius, said Lucian to himself, is the true and exquisite science to be found. He could imagine a man who was able to live in one sense while he pleased, to whom, for example, every impression of touch, taste, hearing, or seeing should be translated into odor, who at the desired kiss should be ravished with the scent of dark violets, to whom music should be the perfume of a rose garden at dawn. When, now and again, he voluntarily resumed the experience of common life, it was that he might return with greater delight to the garden in the city of refuge. In the actual world the talk was of nonconformists, the lodger franchise and the stock exchange. People were constantly reading newspapers, 
drinking Australian burgundy and doing other things equally absurd. They either looked shocked when the fine art of pleasure was mentioned, or confused it with going to musical comedies, drinking bad whiskey and keeping late hours in disreputable and vulgar company. He found to his amusement that the profligate were by many degrees duller than the pious, but that the most tedious of all were the persons who preached promiscuity and called their system of pigging the new morality. He went back to the city lovingly, because it was built and adorned for his love. As the metaphysicians insist on the consciousness of the ego as the implied basis of all thought, so he knew that it was she in whom he had found himself, and through whom and for whom all true life existed. He felt that Annie had taught him the rare magic which had created the Garden of Avalonius. It was for her that he sought strange secrets and tried to penetrate the mysteries of sensation, for he could only give her wonderful thoughts and a wonderful life, and a poor body stained with the scars of his worship. It was with this object, that of making the offering of himself a worthy one, that he continually searched for new and exquisite experiences. He made lovers come before him and confess their secrets. He pried into the inmost mysteries of innocence and shame, noting how passion and reluctance strive together for the mastery. In the amphitheater he sometimes witnessed strange entertainments in which such tales as Daphnis and Chloe and the Golden Ass were performed before him. These shows were always given at night-time. A circle of torch-bearers surrounded the stage in the center, and above all the tiers of seats were dark. He would look up at the soft blue of the summer sky, and at the vast dim mountain hovering like a cloud in the west, and then at the scene illumined by a flaring light, and contrasted with violent shadows." the subdued mutter of conversation in a strange language rising from bench after bench, swift hissing whispers of explanation, now and then a shout or a cry as the interest deepened, the restless tossing of the people as the end drew near, an arm lifted, a cloak thrown back, the sudden blaze of a torch lighting up purple or white or the gleam of gold in the black serried ranks. These were impressions that seemed always amazing. And above, the dusky light of the stars, around the sweet-scented meadows, and the twinkle of lamps from the still city, the cry of the sentries about the walls, the wash of the tide filling the river, and the salt savor of the sea. With such a scenic ornament he saw the tale of Apuleius represented, heard the names of Photus and Berena and Lucius proclaimed, and the deep intonation of such sentences as Exe veneris hortator et armiger liber advenit ultro. The tale went on through all its marvelous adventures, and Lucian left the amphitheater and walked beside the river where he could hear indistinctly the noise of voices and the singing Latin, and note how the rumor of the stage mingled with the murmur of the shuddering reeds and the cool lapping of the tide. Then came the farewell of the cantor, the thunder of applause, the crash of cymbals, the calling of the flutes, and the surge of the wind in the great dark wood. At other times it was his chief pleasure to spend a whole day in a vineyard planted on the steep slope beyond the ridge. A grey stone seat had been placed beneath a shady laurel, and here he often sat without motion or gesture for many hours. Below him the tawny river swept round the town in a half-circle. He could see the swirl of the yellow water, its eddies and miniature whirlpools, as the tide poured up from the south. And beyond the river the strong circuit of the walls, and within the city glittered like a charming piece of mosaic he freed himself from the obtuse modern view of towns as places where human beings live and make money and rejoice or suffer. For, from the standpoint of the moment, such facts were wholly impertinent. He knew perfectly well that for his present purpose 
The tawny sheen and shimmer of the tide was the only fact of importance about the river, and so he regarded the city as a curious work in jewelry. Its radiant marble porticos, the white walls of the villas, a dome of burning copper, the flash and scintillation of tiled roofs, the quiet red of brickwork, dark groves of ilex and cypress and laurel, glowing rose gardens, and here and there the silver of a fountain seemed arranged and contrasted with a wonderful art, and the town appeared a delicious ornament, every cube of color owing its place to the thought and inspiration of the artificer. Lucian, as he gazed from his arbor amongst the trellised vines, lost none of the subtle pleasures of the sight. Noting every nuance of color, he let his eyes dwell for a moment on the scarlet flash of poppies, and then on a glazed roof, which in the glance of the sun seemed to spout white fire. A square of vines was like some rare green stone. The grapes were massed so richly amongst the vivid leaves that, even from far off, there was a sense of irregular flecks and stains of purple running through the green. The laurel garths were like cool jade. The gardens, where red, yellow, blue, and white gleamed together in a mist of heat, had the radiance of opal. The river was a band of dull gold. On every side, as if to enhance the preciousness of the city, the woods hung dark on the hills. Above, the sky was violet, specked with minute feathery clouds, white as snowflakes. It reminded him of a beautiful bowl in his villa. The ground was of that same brilliant blue, and the artist had fused into the work, when it was hot, particles of pure white glass. For Lucian, this was a spectacle that enchanted many hours. Leaning on one hand, he would gaze at the city glowing in the sunlight, till the purple shadows grew down the slopes and the long melodious trumpet sounded for the evening watch. Then, as he strolled beneath the trellises, he would see all the radiant facets glimmering out, and the city faded into haze, a white wall shining here and there, and the gardens veiled in a dim glow of color. On such an evening he would go home with the sense that he had truly lived a day, having received for many hours the most acute impressions of beautiful color. Often he spent the night in the cool court of his villa, lying amidst soft cushions heaped upon the marble bench. A lamp stood on the table at his elbow, its light making the water in the cistern twinkle. There was no sound in the court except the soft, continual plashing of the fountain. Throughout these still hours he would meditate, and he became more than ever convinced that man could, if he pleased, become lord of his own sensations. This, surely, was the true meaning concealed under the beautiful symbolism of alchemy. Some years before he had read many of the wonderful alchemical books of the later Middle Ages, and had suspected that something other than the turning of lead into gold was intended. This impression was deepened when he looked into Lumen de Lumine by Vaughan, the brother of the Silurist, and he had long puzzled himself in the endeavor to find a reasonable interpretation of the hermetic mystery, and of the red powder, glistening and glorious in the sun. And the solution shone out at last, bright and amazing, as he lay quiet in the court of Avalonius. He knew that he himself had solved the riddle, that he held in his hand the powder of projection, the philosopher's stone transmuting all it touched to fine gold, the gold of exquisite impressions. He understood now something of the alchemical symbolism, the crucible and the furnace, the green dragon, and the sun blessed of the fire, had, he saw, a peculiar meaning. He understood, too, why the uninitiated were warned of the terror and danger through which they must pass, and the vehemence with which the adepts disclaimed all desire for material riches no longer struck him as singular. 
The wise man does not endure the torture of the furnace in order that he may be able to compete with operators in pork and company promoters. Neither a steam yacht nor a grouse moor nor three liveried footmen would add at all to his gratifications. Again Lucian said to himself, Only in the court of Avalonius is the true science of the exquisite to be found. He saw the true gold into which the beggarly matter of existence may be transmuted by spagyric art. A succession of delicious moments, all the rare flavors of life concentrated, purged of their lees, and preserved in a beautiful vessel. The moonlight fell green on the fountain and on the curious pavements, and in the long sweet silence of the night he lay still and felt that thought itself was an acute pleasure, to be expressed perhaps in terms of odor or color by the true artist. And he gave himself other and even stranger gratifications. Outside the city walls, between the baths and the amphitheater, was a tavern, a place where wonderful people met to drink wonderful wine. There he saw priests of Mithras and Isis, and of more occult rites from the East, men who wore robes of bright colors and grotesque ornaments symbolizing secret things. They spoke amongst themselves in a rich jargon of colored words, full of hidden meanings and the sense of matters unintelligible to the uninitiated, alluding to what was concealed beneath roses, and calling each other by strange names. And there were actors who gave the shows in the amphitheater, officers of the Legion who had served in wild places, singers and dancing girls and heroes of strange adventure. The walls of the tavern were covered with pictures painted in violent hues, blues and reds and greens jarring against one another and lighting up the gloom of the place. The stone benches were always crowded. The sunlight came in through the door in a long bright beam, casting a dancing shadow of vine leaves on the further wall. There a painter had made a joyous figure of the young Bacchus, driving the lepers before him with his ivy staff, and the quivering shadow seemed a part of the picture. The room was cool and dark and cavernous, but the scent and heat of the summer gushed in through the open door. There was ever a full sound, with noise and vehemence there, and the rolling music of the Latin tongue never ceased. "'The wine of the siege! The wine that we saved!' cried one. "'Look for the jar marked Faunus! You will be glad!' Bring me the wine of the owl's face. Let us have the swine of Saturn's bridge. The boys who served brought the wine in dull red jars that struck a charming note against their white robes. They poured out the violet and purple and golden wine with calm sweet faces, as if they were assisting in the mysteries, without any sign that they heard the strange words that flashed from side to side. The cups were all of glass. Some were of deep green, of the color of the sea near the land, flawed and specked with the bubbles of the furnace. Others were brilliant scarlet, streaked with irregular bands of white, and having the appearance of white globules in the molded stem. There were cups of dark glowing blue, deeper and more shining than the blue of the sky, and running through the substance of the glass were veins of rich gamboge yellow, twining from the brim to the foot. Some cups were of a troubled and clotted red, with alternating blotches of dark and light, some were variegated with white and yellow stains. Some were a film of rainbow colors, some glittered, shot with gold threads through the clear crystal, some were as if sapphires hung suspended in running water, some sparkled with the glint of stars, some were black and golden like tortoise shell. A strange feature was the constant and fluttering motion of hands and arms. Gesture made a constant commentary on speech. White fingers, wider arms, and sleeves of all colors hovered restlessly, appeared and disappeared with an effect of threads crossing and recrossing on the loom and the odor of the place was both curious and memorable, 
something of the damp, cold breath of the cave meeting the hot blast of summer, the strangely mingled aromas of rare wines as they fell plashing and ringing into the cups, the drugged vapor of the east that the priests of Mithras and Isis bore from their steaming temples. These were always strong and dominant. And the women were scented, sometimes with unctuous and overpowering perfumes, and to the artist the experiences of those present were hinted in subtle and delicate nuances of odor. They drank their wine and caressed all day in the tavern. The women threw their round white arms about their lovers' necks. They intoxicated them with the scent of their hair. The priests muttered their fantastic jargon of theurgy. And through the sonorous clash of voices there always seemed the ring of the cry, Look for the jar marked Faunus! You will be glad! Outside the vine tendrils shook on the white walls glaring in the sunshine. The breeze swept up from the yellow river, pungent with the salt sea savor. These tavern scenes were often the subject of Lucian's meditation as he sat amongst the cushions on the marble seat. The rich sound of the voices impressed him above all things, and he saw that words have a far higher reason than the utilitarian office of imparting a man's thought. The common notion that language and linked words are important only as a means of expression he found a little ridiculous as if electricity were to be studied solely with a view of wiring to people, and all its other properties left unexplored, neglected. Language, he understood, was chiefly important for the beauty of its sounds, by its possession of words resonant, glorious to the ear, by its capacity, when exquisitely arranged, of suggesting wonderful and indefinable impressions, perhaps more ravishing and farther removed from the domain of strict thought than the impressions excited by music itself. Here lay hidden the secret of the sensuous art of literature. It was a secret of suggestion, the art of causing delicious sensation by the use of words. In a way, therefore, literature was independent of thought. The mere English listener, if he had an ear attuned, could recognize the beauty of a splendid Latin phrase. Here was the explanation of the magic of Lycidas. From the standpoint of the formal understanding, it was an affected lament over some wholly uninteresting and unimportant Mr. King. It was full of nonsense about shepherds and flocks and muses and such stale stock of poetry. The introduction of St. Peter on a stage thronged with nymphs and river gods was blasphemous, absurd, and in the worst taste. There were touches of greasy Puritanism. The twang of the conventicle was only too apparent. And Lycidas was probably the most perfect piece of pure literature in existence, because every word and phrase and line were sonorous, ringing and echoing with music. Literature, he reenunciated in his mind, is the sensuous art of causing exquisite impressions by means of words. And yet there was something more. Besides the logical thought, which was often a hindrance, a troublesome though inseparable accident, besides the sensation, always a pleasure and a delight, besides these, there were the indefinable, inexpressible images which all fine literature summons to the mind. As the chemist in his experiments is sometimes astonished to find unknown, unexpected elements in the crucible or the receiver, as the world of material things is considered by some a thin veil of the immaterial universe, so he who reads wonderful prose or verse is conscious of suggestions that cannot be put into words which do not rise from the logical sense, which are rather parallel to than connected with the sensuous delight. The world so disclosed is rather the world of dreams, rather the world in which children sometimes live, instantly appearing and instantly vanishing away, a world beyond all expression or analysis, neither of the intellect nor of the senses. He called these fancies of his meditations of a tavern, 
and was amused to think that a theory of letters should have risen from the eloquent noise that rang all day about the violet and golden wine. "'Let us seek for more exquisite things,' said Lucian to himself. He could almost imagine the magic transmutation of the senses accomplished. The strong sunlight was an odor in his nostrils. It poured down on the white marble and the palpitating roses like a flood. The sky was a glorious blue, making the heart joyous, and the eyes could rest in the dark green leaves and purple shadow of the ilex. The earth seemed to burn and leap beneath the sun. He fancied he could see the vine tendrils stir and quiver in the heat, and the faint fume of the scorching pine needles was blown across the gleaming garden to the seat beneath the porch. Wine was before him in a cup of carved amber, a wine of the color of a dark rose, with a glint as of a star or of a jet of flame deep beneath the rim. The cup was twined about with a delicate wreath of ivy. He was often loath to turn away from the still contemplation of such things, from the mere joy of the violent sun and the responsive earth. He loved his garden and the view of the tessellated city from the vineyard on the hill, the strange clamor of the tavern and white photos appearing on the torch-lit stage. And there were shops in the town in which he delighted, the shops of the perfume-makers and jewelers and dealers in curious ware. He loved to see all things made for ladies' use, to touch the gossamer silks that were to touch their bodies, to finger the beads of amber and the gold chains which would stir above their hearts, to handle the carved hairpins and brooches, to smell odors which were already dedicated to love. But though these were sweet and delicious gratifications, he knew that there were more exquisite things of which he might be a spectator. He had seen the folly of regarding fine literature from the standpoint of the logical intellect, and he now began to question the wisdom of looking at life as if it were a moral representation. Literature, he knew, could not exist without some meaning, and considerations of right and wrong were to a certain extent inseparable from the conception of life, but to insist on ethics as the chief interest of the human pageant was surely absurd. One might as well read Lycidas for the sake of its denunciation of our corrupted clergy, or Homer for manners and customs. An artist, entranced by a beautiful landscape, did not greatly concern himself with the geological formation of the hills, nor did the lover of a wild sea inquire as to the chemical analysis of the water. Lucian saw a colored and complex life displayed before him, and he sat enraptured at the spectacle not concerned to know whether actions were good or bad, but content if they were curious. In this spirit he made a singular study of corruption. Beneath his feet, as he sat in the garden porch, was a block of marble through which there ran a scarlet stain. It began with a faint line, thin as a hair, and grew as it advanced, sending out offshoots to right and left and broadening to a pool of brilliant red. There were strange lives into which he looked that were like the block of marble. Women with grave, sweet faces told him the astounding tale of their adventures, and how, they said, they had met the fawn when they were little children. They told him how they had played and watched by the vines and the fountains, and dallied with the nymphs, and gazed at images reflected in the water-pools, till the authentic face appeared from the wood. He heard others tell how they had loved the satyrs for many years before they knew their race, and there were strange stories of those who had longed to speak but knew not the word of the enigma, and searched in all strange paths and ways before they found it. He heard the history of the woman who fell in love with her slave-boy, and tempted him for three years in vain. He heard the tale from the woman's full red lips and watched her face, full of the ineffable sadness of lust, as she described her curious stratagems in mellow phrases. She was drinking a sweet yellow wine from a gold cup as she spoke, and the odor in her hair and the aroma of the precious wine seemed to mingle with the soft, strange words that flowed like an unguent from a carven jar. 
she told how she bought the boy in the market of an Asian city, and had him carried to her house in the grove of fig trees. Then, she went on, he was led into my presence as I sat between the columns of my court. A blue veil was spread above to shut out the heat of the sun, and rather twilight than light shone on the painted walls, and the wonderful colors of the pavement and the images of love and the mother of love. The men who brought the boy gave him over to my girls, who undressed him before me, one drawing gently away his robe, another stroking his brown and flowing hair, another praising the whiteness of his limbs, and another caressing him and speaking loving words in his ear. But the boy looked sullenly at them all, striking away their hands and pouting with his lovely and splendid lips, and I saw a blush, like the rosy veil of dawn, reddening his body and his cheeks. Then I made them bathe him and anoint him with scented oils from head to foot, till his limbs shone and glistened with the gentle and mellow glow of an ivory statue. Then I said, You are bashful, because you shine alone amongst us all. See, we too will be your fellows. The girls began first of all fondling and kissing one another, and doing for each other the offices of waiting-maids. They drew out the pins and loosened the bands of their hair, and I never knew before that they were so lovely. The soft and shining tresses flowed down, rippling like sea-waves. Some had hair golden and radiant as this wine in my cup. The faces of others appeared amidst the blackness of ebony. There were locks that seemed of burnished and scintillating copper. Some glowed with hair of tawny splendor, and others were crowned with the brightness of the sardonyx. Then, laughing and without the appearance of shame, they unfastened the brooches and bands which sustained their robes, and so allowed silk and linen to flow swiftly to the stained floor, so that one would have said there was a sudden apparition of the fairest nymphs. With many festive and jocose words they began to incite each other to mirth, praising the beauties that shone on every side, and calling the boy by a girl's name they invited him to be their playmate. But he refused, shaking his head and still standing dumbfounded and abashed, as if he saw a forbidden and terrible spectacle. Then I ordered the women to undo my hair and my clothes, making them caress me with the tenderness of the fondest lover, but without avail, for the foolish boy still scowled and pouted out his lips, stained with an imperial and glorious scarlet. She poured out more of the topaz-colored wine in her cup, and Lucian saw it glitter as it rose to the brim and mirrored the gleam of the lamps. The tale went on, recounting a hundred strange devices. The woman told how she had tempted the boy by idleness and ease, giving him long hours of sleep, and allowing him to recline all day on soft cushions that swelled about him enclosing his body. She tried the experiment of curious odors, causing him to smell always about him the oil of roses, and burning in his presence rare gums from the east. He was allured by soft dresses, being clothed in silks that caressed the skin with the sense of a fondling touch. Three times a day they spread before him a delicious banquet, full of savor and odor and color. Three times a day they endeavored to intoxicate him with delicate wine. And so, the lady continued, I spared nothing to catch him in the glistening nets of love, taking only sour and contemptuous glances in return. And at last, in an incredible shape, I won the victory. And then, having gained a green crown, fighting in agony against his green and crude immaturity, I devoted him to the theater, where he amused the people by the splendor of his death. On another evening he heard the history of the man who dwelt alone, refusing all allurements, and was at last discovered to be the lover of a black statue and there were tales of strange cruelties, of men taken by mountain robbers and curiously maimed and disfigured, so that when they escaped and returned to the town they were thought to be monsters and killed at their own doors. 
Lucian left no dark or secret nook of life unvisited. He sat down, as he said, at the banquet, resolved to taste all the savors and to leave no flagon unvisited. His relations grew seriously alarmed about him at this period. While he heard with some inner ear the suave and eloquent phrases of singular tales, and watched the lamplight in amber and purple wine, his father saw a lean pale boy, with black eyes that burnt in hollows, and sad and sunken cheeks. "'You ought to try and eat more, Lucian,' said the parson. "'And why don't you have some beer?' He was looking feebly at the roast mutton and sipping a little water, but he would not have eaten or drunk with more relish if the choicest meat and drink had been before him. His bones seemed, as Miss Deacon said, to be growing through his skin. He had all the appearance of an ascetic whose body has been reduced to misery by long and grievous penance. People who chanced to see him could not help saying to one another, "'How ill and wretched that Lucian Taylor looks!' They were of course quite unaware of the joy and luxury in which his real life was spent, and some of them began to pity him and to speak to him kindly. It was too late for that. The friendly words had as much lost their meaning as the words of contempt. Edward Dixon hailed him cheerfully in the street one day. "'Come into my den, won't you, old fellow?' he said. "'Won't you see the pater? I've managed to bag a bottle of his old port, and I know you smoke like a furnace, and I've got some ripping cigars. You will come, won't you? I can tell you the pater's booze is first-rate.' He gently declined and went on. Kindness and unkindness, pity and contempt, had become for him mere phrases. He could not have distinguished one from the other. Hebrew and Chinese, Hungarian and Pushtu, would be pretty much alike to an agricultural laborer. If he cared to listen, he might detect some general differences in sound, but all four tongues would be equally devoid of significance. To Lucian, entranced in the garden of Alonius, it seemed very strange that he had once been so ignorant of all the exquisite meanings of life. Now, beneath the violet sky, looking through the brilliant trellis of the vines, he saw the picture. Before, he had gazed in sad astonishment at the squalid rag which was wrapped about it. End of chapter 4